Hi guys, what's rule one in doing a Facebook Live? Just press the button and start. Um, guys, I'm a little bit nervous about today's topic because it can be really polarizing. And there's so many dots of I's and crosses of T's in this conversation that um, it can be a little bit tricky to navigate sometimes. So, today I'm gonna to talk about internal movement and what internal movement is and try and define it and discuss where it fits into Qigong practice. Now, the reason I can say this is quite polarizing is because a lot of the Qigong being done out there at the moment is very basic style Qigong. And when I say this, I always find I get into the conversations of, of you know, feeling a bit conceited or a bit egotistical or judgmental or saying that something's wrong or bad and, and that, that's not it at all. So I'm just going to plough straight on through and as I know I should just give my content and be happy with it, right? So here we go. So what is internal movement? So internal movement is defined as when we get our chi to flow to an area of our body. Um, the way I like to describe this is, is that our core is like a tube of toothpaste, okay? It holds all our internal organs, uh, and as our hara has all our chi and blood in it, and all our body energy, right? Our, our organs are like batteries, and so our core has all this battery power in it. So if we imagine our body like a tube of toothpaste, if I got a tube of toothpaste, and screwed the cap off, throw the cap away, grabbed the tube of toothpaste and went boom and squeezed the tube and twisted it tightly. Even if I just twisted it without even squeezing it, toothpaste would squeeze out of the top of the tube. This is the same way that we're meant to get the chi flowing to different parts of our body in internal movement. We've got to actually activate our core. So in Western exercise science, you know, our core is held very rigid in most exercises. Like if you were to do um, really any, any, any Western exercise, the idea is, you know, we, we close off and we, we tighten our core. And if we were to do a deadlift, you know, our core would be held really strong and we'd, we'd lift up. Or if we had dumbbells in either hand, our core would have to be really solid. And some of the progressions of those exercises where you, then you may hold a different sized weight in each hand, like 10 kilo in this hand and say five kilo in this hand, and do and do exercises so you're stabilizing your core. So in Chinese exercise and qigong and internal movement, this concept is completely different. In Chinese exercise, in qigong, all the movement comes from your core, from dantian, okay? Now, that movement has to be caused by Dantian. So, one of the ways to understand that someone is doing um, basic Qigong, right, um, is that there is very little core movement, okay? So, you might see someone doing, you know, the first move of their Tai Chi like this. Okay, and I'm going to explain why you can pick up straight away that that is extremely basic movement. Okay, and, and this, you know, okay, it's a bit conceited, it's a bit egotistic, but I see plenty of so-called generational masters still doing their form like this, starting out their form. And when I've questioned them, and trust me, I've been kicked off heaps of forums on Facebook um, questioning and talk, trying to open up discussions about this because people have very rigid mindsets. And this is a really interesting concept they have rigid mindsets because I think with the fluidity that you should be getting out of your Taiji and Qigong practice, your mind should also be fluid to open up concepts. So I constantly run into Tai Chi and Qigong people who are like, but my master is a seventh generation freaking such and such. And he has direct translation from, and I'm like, yeah, but he's still doing it wrong. He's so, well, not wrong, he's doing it at a very basic level. And when you try and open up this conversation, they shut it down because 
their premise is that the energy comes from Dantian. Therefore, when they do this movement, they are projecting their chi from Dantian into their arms and down. And, well, that's kind of, in an essence, right. Because if their chi didn't exist, their arm wouldn't exist. So I guess that's kind of right. But the movement has to come from Dantian, and that doesn't mean that some mystical energy comes up and moves your arm. And it doesn't, you know, you can, you can have, say, yeah, but I've got the intent. But that's still not internal movement. That intent's great. But how do we increase and progress in our internal education and in our Qigong to make this a true internal movement? So, I generally get my students to run a bit of a, a problem, a bit of a Zen Cohen that I have created over time. And if you don't know what a Zen Cohen is, it's like if one hand, uh, if one hand claps in a forest, one hand clapping, or if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a noise, right? It's one of those things that makes you go, oh. does it? It's meant to clear the mind. So my little Taiji Qigong Zen Cohen is, I get them to pick a dot on a wall and stand just opposite, just so their hand can touch where the dot would be. Their fingers would swipe past the dot. And I say, okay, your fingers have to touch that dot. Now, the problem is, your arm's not allowed to move. Your arm can move, but you're not allowed to move your arm. And they're like, what? And you see people and they go, oh, that was my arm moving. Oh, my arm moved, right? Your arm's allowed to move, but you're not allowed to move your arm. So the only way to do that is actually to move your core, to actually swing your body, to get your, my arm didn't, you know, I didn't move my arm, but my arm has moved as a consequence of what my core has done, okay? So internal movement, what we need to do is learn all our Qigong movements and how they arise from a rotation and a squeeze of our core. Okay, so like the tube of toothpaste concept, I need to learn to squeeze my abdomen and my core, which squeezes the energy out of my organs, out of my core, out, creating the chi and blood to move through my body, to create a single leg movement. I have to move my body to get this leg to move through. I can't just pick up my leg and move it, right? That's an external movement. So we've kind of lost internal movement. You know, we walk up to a kitchen bench to have breakfast and we switch on the kettle and we get some toast out, we put toast in the toaster and we put it down. We're not actually moving using our whole body. And it would be a bit silly to do that, right? We, we've evolved to have both modes of movement. But the thing is, when we're doing our Qigong, when we're going back to that primordial ancestral concept of working with our Jing Qi Shen cycle, about getting our body to flow, to dissolve um, sequence of movements into one single movement, that's when internal movement becomes super important. And the way it works with the body, the way it works with the spine, the way it works with our mind, it helps us to, I guess in a sense, regress or delete the negative patterns or the different ways of we hold ourselves to get back into that concept of how we can actually come into that Taoist concept of being one, where my body may be doing different things, but it's one single movement because it's one thing that's happening here. Now, the best way I can explain that is, say like riding a bike, okay? You're on your bike and your legs are going, you're pedaling away and you're turning with your arms. Now, that's an integrated movement where lots of different parts are doing things separately to create one action, okay? Riding a bike. But it's a collection of parts and a sequence that you've programmed in. It's not one single movement. Okay, one single movement has to happen from one single movement of your body. So one single movement of my arm out here doesn't move that arm. That is an external movement. So for instance, if I was doing my Tai Chi, uh, tai chi form or a Qigong form, and I was going like that, that's not one single movement. That is 
this arm and this arm moving together in sequence. Okay? To get both arms to rise up together without doing anything, I have to shake my body. Okay? My arms have to be super loose so there's no tension. Otherwise, if there's tension, the toothpaste won't squeeze out, right? Like my arms are tense and I shake, right? My arms won't do anything. They need to be super loose so I can shake and cause my body to do something. So all our Qigong has to be done in this way if we really want to get the Qi from Dantian flowing and rippling out of our body. And it really is a ripple. Now, animals move like this, okay? So, um, I was on the Great Barrier Reef here in Australia, right? And I was, I was swimming after a little reef shark. And any little one, you know, he's only small because I'm a bit scared of sharks. I don't like him, but he was pretty small. So I was swimming after him to have a good look at him, trying to take a photo of him. And as when I got into his proximity range of he suspected danger, he literally just flicked his tail and he disappeared into the, you know, out into the darkness. One single flick of his tail, his whole spine, the length of this, this shark, he just flicked it and that was the propeller for his tail to whip. Our spine has the same function. Now we have an axial skeleton, arms and legs, but our spine can still activate these. And one of the best ways you've probably already done this, right, is if you're rotating from side to side and get your arms to rotate round if they're nice and loose, okay? Our spine's twisting, so my arms can move, okay? That is actually more of an internal movement. That is one movement causing both arms to do something else. But we have to integrate this through to all our exercises. Okay, so that's a little bit about what internal movement is. Now I need to keep myself on track, otherwise this will go on forever. Right, biomechanics, which I've kind of just touched on. I love the way I do that. Okay, so, in our Qigong, the biomechanics, the reason we take these stances, these horse riding stances where we're sunk and our coccyx tucked under and our spine's nice and straight, is so we can actually free up our spine to move our axial skeleton. Now, one of the best examples I've had of this is a guy named Scott Sonnen, who's an American um, martial artist and, and, uh, and trainer, and, and he's got a system called TACFIT. Now, he talks about doing squats, and when he does squats, he gets people to go on track so their legs are wide. Um, sorry, lunges. Most people, when they do lunges, go quite thin, and that actually leaves us working on anti-rotator muscles so we don't topple over. When our legs are actually slightly wider and on a shoulder width style track, our spine and our core actually stay stable so we can move our spine but still have stability. So it allows for power and drive through our spine. He talks about how important this is for um, sports people, play football and stuff like that, because, um, so I'm just gonna turn down my binging here because that enables them the power to, you know, drive through a movement, get a ball and, and move, right? Whereas if the stance is quite thin, we're gonna to topple, you know, we get tackled, we're gonna to topple, at least if I'm wide on my spine, if I get tackled, I can turn fast, I can rotate my body. So the biomechanics of correct internal movement starts to allow us to pump and get our core to start pumping and rippling movement. And this ripple causes the chi and the jing and the shen to flow with it. So part of the increased mindfulness aspect of correct internal movement is that the shen travels with the chi. Your consciousness, your very consciousness travels with the chi. So as you're rippling this chi out from your core in one single movement, Okay, my two arms are doing something very different at the moment. Well, they're out of sequence because my body is causing the movement and rotating. Now, there's five different levels of internal movement, okay? Most people are practicing the beginner levels of level one and two. Then there's an intermediate level where we really start integrating the movements all from Dantian. Then there's level four, which is about energy transfer, a thing called Fa Jing, which I'll touch on in a minute. 
and level five, which is small frame or soft farging. So level one and level two is where most people are at. And what level one and level two allow us to do is learn forms, learn where our body is meant to go. So for instance, okay, we might be doing a movement like this, okay? And we're double weighted. Now double weighted is a fundamental breaking of the rule of true internal movement, okay? Where movement is generated through a crossing, a, 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 a momentum caused by the shift of body weight through our body. So we're rippling the mass of our body, okay? Which allows, when we ripple mass out, to have that grounded and energetic uh, intent behind our movements. So we're double weighted, we're standing with our weight in between both our legs. Both my hands are both changing yin together, they're both changing yang together, okay? Students need to learn at this level, okay? There's nothing wrong with it at all, okay? Everyone needs to learn at this level because they need to learn that their hands need to move on these tracks when they start integrating more whole body movement at about a level three of movement, okay? So, for instance, um, in this movement I'm doing here, when I start to tell people, if I, tell, if I tell them too early in their progression through learning in the levels of internal movement, and I say, okay, now turn your body right, then left, they start doing that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Your hands still need to move on the same tracks, but your body needs to turn with it. You need the squishing of your quads to squeeze the energy out so your body functions in a certain way. And they, it blow, kind of blows their mind because, oh, but you know, now I'm turning left and right. So that's level one, okay? We need to learn things double weighted because our brain needs to process that information, okay? We need to learn that. Now, as you can see, that is a physical movement. It's an external movement. My arms are moving without my body causing them to happen, okay? If I want my arms to move as a consequence of my body, I need to rotate and activate a sequence of muscles through my core to enable that to happen. Okay? Now what this also allows is it allows me to drive power into movements. This is where I start to talk about the internal martial arts and why it's so important to understand how to drive power into your movements. Now a lot of people who do Qigong for just general exercise, health and well-being, compassion, spiritual growth, etc, etc, they can get a little bit timid when I start talking about this stuff because they're like, oh my God, I, I, I don't want violence, I don't want aggression. I'm like, yeah, totally get that, neither do I, who does? But that's part of our animal. That's part of who we are. And so you may not need to think about, oh, you know, I need to defend myself or I need to strike someone, but you need to integrate power, whole body power, whole body movement to get the chi flowing, okay? Through doing that and integrating conjoined sequence of movements into one movement, you're actually finding oneness in movement. You're actually joining your mind and body. It becomes then a mind and body exercise, not a body exercise that I'm kind of semi-using my mind to do, okay? You have to really start to integrate how your body's working and keeping your mind and your shen on the very edge of movement to get these things to happen. Okay, level two of internal movement is when we start to differentiate between the yin and yang and the full and empty a little bit. So that's where people might start to actually learn to rock forward and back. They start to learn, and I'll come a little bit closer here, I'll have to get right down, right? So a lot of people, you'll see them do their, their qigong and they'll have these extremely, um, extremes of yin and yang in their hands. And you see pictures of people doing their, doing their single whips and their hands are, you know, in these extreme yin and yang postures, okay? 
So in level two, we start to redefine that and we start to make these changes more subtle. So instead of going, my hands have changed yang, they've come up, now they change yin and go down, there's no change happening between here and here. Okay, it's changed the whole way, it's changed and it's traveling down. There's no change in the wrists. So the best way to explain this is like, if you've ever done the little light bulb experiment in science where you get a battery, which has got negative and positive terminals, you connect wire from the negative round to one terminal of the light and the, uh, the positive round from one terminal to light and the negative round to the negative terminal, which causes the electrons to flow, which causes the light to go on, okay? If at any time that flow of electrons is broken, the light ceases to exist, the current ceases to exist, the electricity ceases to exist. And as we know from yin and yang, we need polarity in nature to create change. So if our hands are going, this, if our hands are these, are not changing throughout the movement, the flow of electrons, the current has been broken within your body. We call these broken movements, okay? So we start to explain this in level two so that students start to learn that from the bottom here to the top, there's slow, gradual change. Now I'm completely relaxed from completely relaxed to here, there is slow, gradual change in the wrist. This leads to a state called Sung. Sung is translated a lot of the time to be um, moving without feeling the movement, but I don't like that description. It's not how it feels to me. To me, it feels like only feeling one single movement. So like, for instance, I might be in my Taiji form and I may be doing a movement like this and my hands and legs are doing very different things. Okay. But my knees, my shoulders, my elbows, my wrists, they're all doing, they're all being caused by one thing. One movement, one shake of how my core is moving. So it takes me from a state of differentiation into wholeness, right? When the Tao is the one and it splits into the yin and yang, the two and then the multitude of things, this brings your body back into alignment with that one, one movement, okay, as opposed to a collection of movements. So that's Sung. And Sung progresses as you move up through the levels. So that's the two basic levels. One, just learning gross movement, okay? Hands are changing, hands are changing down. Level two, we start to rock our weight forward and we start to learn about gradual changing of the hands and this differentiation between full and empty in our legs, okay? So if we were doing another movement where our weight was um, on the front foot and on the back leg, we'd actually start to differentiate between, okay, my front foot's now empty, my back foot's full, I'm sending my weight into my front foot, grounding it. Now my back leg is empty and my front foot is full, okay? We start to differentiate about those types of things. This again is polarity, full and empty, creating a movement of energy between one and the other, okay? Level three is when we move into the inter intermediate stage, this is actually quite actually an advanced level. This is, when our Qigong and our Taiji become fully integrated with weight shift, see how my weight shifted to the uh, right, shifting over to the left. My body is rotating, my hands are gently changing through the movement, one is following the other, okay? No longer do we have two hands moving together, which is a double weight, double weightedness, so that's a break of principle. Now one hand, is leading the other hand, okay? Again, this starts to create polarity between the two, okay? If you have two yang things, there's no polarity. If you have two yin things, there's no polarity. You need some change, some differentiation between the yin and yang. So as you can see, the progression of the levels start to differentiate this up to level three. Now up to level three, you're completely using your core, for moving even your leg, so I have to move my leg, uh, sorry, move my core to get my, to power my leg. I can't just lift up my leg and put it forward, okay? That's a simple external movement, okay? 
so much more I could say on this. Level four. Level four is when we learn when that internal movement starts to power up to the point that we produce something called Far Jin. Far Jin uh, literally translates into explosive energy. Now, this is used extensively in the internal martial arts, right? One of the reasons why I think the internal martial arts, some of the internal martial arts have at least maintained this is because when defending yourself using Qigong movements, right? Because all Tai Chi is Qigong. Whether you're doing self-defense and fighting or whether you're doing it slow and meditatively, the internal movement makes it an energy an energy movement, right? So one of the reasons that the internal martial arts has this down is because we have to defend ourselves. So when I'm training with partners and you know they're throwing punches in, I have to move my core to cause my body <laughs> to do things. So farging is this way of releasing explosive energy. Now, I'm gonna get into the three levels of, of internal movement in a minute, just to help explain this, but farging is important even at a health level. Okay, Fajing is the shark flicking its tail. That was Fajing. All animals use this. You've probably used it too when you sneeze and your whole body shakes, or when you get a fright and the whole body responds. Okay, but it, learning in the internal way is to learn to master your fight and flight response. So I've read a couple of articles recently which is about um, like an animal, right? So like a, a zebra out on the plains and it gets chased by a lion and, the, and it outruns the lion, the lion gives up. And 20, you know, five minutes later, the zebra's back out of fright, out of flight, and it's just eating grass, right? It's back into, what do they call it? Rest and regenerate or something like that, right? It's just chilled again, it's eating grass, it's completely forgotten about the lion, it's over it. Its body returns to homeostasis, back into rest. Rest and digest, that's it. So Fajing allows us to start training our mind so that we can go from zero to 100 and back to zero as needed, okay? This is great for conflict resolution situations when you're getting excited, shit's going down, and you just need to, you know, chill. Or it can be good if you're in a conflict situation, they try and hurt you and you need to fash! Right, you need to respond quickly, you need to cause this to happen. now. Getting our arms and legs to do things is slow. Shaking our spine directly connected to our central nervous system and our brain and our reptilian fight and flight response. Shaking our spine is the fastest way to get a response of our, out of our body. It's gonna be the first thing to react. So we shake our spine. This is why the shark flicked its tail. This is why you'll see monkeys as they scoot across the ground using their whole body, okay? When horses buck, it's a spine shake to shake the rider off, okay? It's all far jing. It's a natural thing that we have. So whilst we use it extensively in the internal martial arts to generate lots of power, which is what it's used for in Qigong as well, but just on maybe a more self-healing level. So for instance, I do a little Qigong here, okay? Right where we start building like, I don't like the description, just me personally, but we start building a chi ball, right? It's about compressing energy into our arms to make ourselves more robust, right? And having nice strong arms is good because our upper body is all about um, our resistance, our wei chi and our resistance to disease, right? So actually banging our arms can actually be quite a good, good method to build that up. And if you're not quite up to that level, rubbing them, okay? But I digress. So we're doing this exercise. Now we want the chi to condense, okay? And the energy of the kidney, which relates to our bones, is <gasps> fright, contraction, right? When you get a big fright from someone, the kidney energy goes <gasps> and pulls you in. So we use this shock. This farging is a shock way to actually get the energy to <laughs> suck more internally into our body. So we've been doing this Qigong to build all this energy in our system, to build up all the energy in our forearms and our fingers and our hands. It's also great for healing, like if you're a Reiki or a massage therapist, 
right? Build more energy into our palms. And you can see here my body's rotating. The hands aren't working together. The hands are working. But then when I build up to a point, I finish with like a little farging clap, right? And the bah! And you feel the energy in your body sink, okay? I've also seen farging used in the jungle by shamanic um, Shipibo tribes people uh, in an ayahuasca ceremony when I was there a good 12 years ago. And the shaman were, were really shocked, right? Because they were doing it on these healing methods with people and then I was just trying to copy them, right? Being an acupuncturist and a healer, I'm, I'm into it, right? I'm, I'm in now, what are they doing, what are they doing? And I just did it. And the shaman, like you could just see the look on their face like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> what? And I later, you know, because I got along with them quite well, I started explaining about the internal martial arts and they were like, oh, that's awesome, you know, that's great. Because it's a way of integrating and they used it um, in a really similar way to one of the healing methods I teach to help clear the shen and they were doing a really similar thing. Which is why we got along because, you know, between my acupuncture and my internal martial arts, so many similar concepts that they were doing, like even the way they were working on people's backs. So I'm working on someone's back at the moment, right? With the Yoni armor and they were using like a little um, a native uh, fern that they'd wrapped up and they were banging it on people and, and singing prayers. And then they would finish with this little soft farging method above their head and they would... I don't know if you can see my fingers in here, my fingers like going, eh, wobbling, right? Because I'm literally going, bah, doing that farging, but at a smaller, softer level, okay? My spine, my energy on the inside is doing the same thing, but it's just not having the outward expression that explosive farging would have. And so once you start to really learn your explosive farging, you go bah! and learn how to use farging in different qigong methods, um, then, you know, like uh, another one I teach for the kidneys, when we're ha! it's a shake, boom! Right, and it's to build up really good, strong kidney energy. Now, not everyone has to do it at that level. If we're doing it at level one and two, you know, we're kind of just crossing our weight and just learning it simple. But, right, Qigong is about building up body strength, building up resilience, building up power, whether it's for your own self-healing or to be able to heal other people. We need to be robust and strong. That's why Qigong is a warrior's meditation a lot of the time because you need to be strong, okay? And so as you build up, what these levels do is they allow you to progress and they allow you to build up whole body strength. So my belief is, not that I can prove this, but it makes a lot of sense to me, right? That's why I like staffies, dogs, are so strong in comparison to humans. Because they've never stopped using their body in an integrated, animalistic, internal way. So because their body is working as an integrated whole all the time, the fascia, the connectivity, the neurological connections, the biology, the biochemistry is all working together to produce one single movement or one single intent. By breaking this up in ourselves, we don't have that connectivity anymore. That's one of the things that progressing in the levels of internal movement starts to teach us. And it's why from close range, as an internal martial artist, you could get in a lot of explosive power. It's what animals do. Now, as far as healing is concerned, okay, again, what if I changed a big palm strike, right? Someone's attacked me and I'm whoop, boom! I wanna, I wanna defend myself. What if now I've got a client who's got an injury or is deficient in energy. Okay, I don't want to hit them, right? What if I just walked up and connected to Dante and actually started to do the same kind of movement? Connecting my whole body through into my palm. So it's not me just sitting there with my palm out, trying to give them energy through going, I am giving this person energy but there's actually a whole body integrated intent from the tips of my toes to the way my feet just gripped into the ground. 
to the way my legs activated, the kidney meridian picked up on the inside of my groin, the way my perineum just opened to allow my central channel to flow, the way my rib here slightly squeezed to activate the pumping action of the meridians underneath my arm and in my armpit, in the intent, in the openness of my hand, in everything that I'm expressing, which is now me extremely slowly, minutely, you can't see it, I'm literally going and striking, but now my intent is loving kindness. It's not self-defense, but it still comes out of a whole body fudging movement. So, what was my next point? I wanted to explain fudging, I've done that. I wanted to explain how that helps with healing, I've done that. Um, okay, so let's kind of just recap a little bit then maybe. So, what I plan on doing in this group and what, I, what my thing is about Qigong that I want to impart to people is I want to start breaking down this idea that Qigong is these single movements that aren't integrated with our body. Okay? Now my body has to rotate, but you see a lot of movements like people will be doing cloud hands and the body isn't turning. Now that's great, right? Because you need to learn that your hands are moving in this way. Okay? But then you need to start integrating whole body movement and turning of your body into these qigong. So you're integrating whole body intent, whole body movement, whole body purpose, squeezing the energy out of your core to make these things happen. Excuse me. Um, so that's about internal movement. Um, what I might do, since I've been ranting for a bloody long time now, is just go over a little bit of my Taiji form. Uh, take about five minutes or so, I'll do it reasonably quickly. And just watch the way my body and my core moves to create the movement. I'll try and exaggerate it because in the end, like a level five soft fudging, that's my first movement, which most people would do like, oh, sorry, like this, right? Because what's meant to happen in your Qigong is you start out with this much external movement, and this much internal energy movement. And what you plan on ending up with is this much external movement and this much internal energy movement, which can be shown like when I was just doing that healing method, the physical movement's small but the connection that I have to the way my body's producing energy is much larger. So, oh, just a quick point. So another, another reason that it can be good to learn your Qigong in this way is that Qigong literally means Qi work, right? You need to be doing something. There needs to be, the mind needs to be active. Okay, there needs to be an intent. So some people go, oh, yeah, but I don't want to learn to hit people. I'm like, yeah, right, okay, I totally get that, I totally understand. So let's imagine you're closing a really big heavy cupboard, a big wood oak door, okay? Let's do some work, let's change these movements into some having some real intent behind it. Because I can just do this all day and just move my arm backwards and forwards in a Qigong. But if I'm not doing anything, then I'm not liberating the energy out to my extremities. So when I'm doing my Taiji, when I'm doing martial arts, where I'm thinking, all right, you know, I'm fighting this, this six foot four freaking cranky dude who wants to rip my head off so I can actually get my body to liberate the amount of energy it would need to defend itself against the six foot four cranky dude who's ready to rip my head off. So we need to create the work. So by doing that and thinking this guy's gonna, you know, hurt me or harm me, my body goes, right, send all this chi down to his arm. And all the chi, you know, all the energy, all the neurochemistry, all the intent, all the muscle fibers go, right, something's gonna happen. Hey, there's no six foot four guy here. Oh, right, so look, while we're here, let's work on this inflammation. Let's work on that muscle injury. Let's keep flowing through the body and looking for any other injuries in our body and work on that while we're here because you know we've been produced, all this energy's been created. We may as well do something while we're here. 
Okay, so we need to be doing something when we do our Qigong. This is super important. And so our internal movement allows us to increase that activation of our body literally doing work. Okay, you can feel the pumping, you can feel the power in your hands, not just an arm, it's not just a muscular movement anymore. It becomes, you can feel the connectedness of the pressure that you're creating, okay? Pressure's a fantastic analogy. If you think of a globe like the planet, the planet, and the low and high pressure systems moving around, it's a good idea to think about how yin and yang move around the body. So when we're doing our internal movements, if I was doing this Qigong again, my body's acting like a chi pump. Now I'm really exaggerating the movements I would do so you can see a little bit more of this kind of movement being used. Okay, so my body's literally having to do something there. There's a connectivity, it's causing a ripple out flow of all this energy. I'm digressing again, awesome. Okay, so let me do a little bit of my form. Let's see if we can pick this up. I'm gonna do it slightly larger than I would normally do it for myself. You can see my body shift sides. You might see little shakes. Body will always be turning to create the arms to move. If my body stops moving, my arms stop moving. There's no time that my arms can move independently from my body. As soon as my arms move independently, so I'm going to do a little bit of a farging movement right now. <laughs> Now, of course, not everyone wants to do their chicken at that level. It's not to say that you have to. But as I said, the farging is a, is, a, is a level four. It's extremely advanced sort of level of doing chigong, which the, you know, the chigong masters and the taiji masters used to use to teach themselves about how to transfer energy. And that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the three different levels of internal training, right? So let me just, uh, right? So the um, three levels of inter uh, internal training are self-healing, okay? That's learning our form. That's reintegrating our body, getting it to turn, getting it to move again, freeing up our spine, freeing up the way our body begins to work again to get our body to have a single intent in movement even though the arms and legs and everything are doing different things, it all comes from one single movement of what my core is doing, okay? Reintegrates the body, allows for healing. Level two is chi transference, okay? And further cultivation of energy. So this is when our qigong starts to get a little bit stronger and we start to integrate fa jing. Our body has to be extremely strong internally, physically, and energetically to do Fa Jing. In fact, if I haven't trained hard Fa Jing, explosive Fa Jing for quite some time, and then I go out and I just do a bunch, my body literally can feel like it's been ripped apart because my conditioning has dropped and that connectivity, or not using my body connectedly for so long, literally makes these big boar fudging shaky movements shake my body so intensely that it really shakes it up. So fudging creates a really high level of intensegrity field within your body. And that tensegrity field is how the fascia and the neurochemistry and the neurobiology and the muscles all work together in fluid and in harmony. And so if you haven't done this in a while and that level of conditioning has decreased, then a lot of farging can really shake you up. So that second level of training is to develop a really robust body, really strong internal frame. Then level, oh, and learning how to put energy into people through farging, 
Okay? So internal martial arts, yeah, it's you know, learning to actually you know, put energy in as you're striking people. And there's a real physical basis for that as well, but we're also talking about energy transmission. Then we take that learning and we take it onto the third level of internal training, which is about how we use our energy to heal other people. Uh, qigong, med true medical qigong. I hear a lot of people say medical qigong is in reference to, I'm doing the qigong for liver. Okay, yeah, that's medical, but that's self-healing. I take medical to mean treating other people. And so that's the third level. Medical qigong is way key alpha, or healing through en uh, external energy transmission. So we build up, we heal ourselves, we build up our energy. Level one, level two, we build up more energy, make our bodies nice, strong, robust. We learn about energy transference through learning Fa Jing, through learning how to use our spine to whip and create movement. Then at the third level, we take all that energy we've learned to transfer and we've produced and squeeze it through a straw. So instead of having all this oh, external energy that we're using to, you know, in, you know, very externalized internal energy of explosive Fa Jing, and we squish it down through a straw. And it's like a little laser beam of love. Yeah, so when you're sitting there and I'm needling someone in my clinic, I have this tensegrity field. My body is working, it's squeezing energy at a really subtle level into someone. When I've got my hands on someone and I'm massaging them, my body's tensegrity system, I'm doing that with my body. See, my body's squeezing and it's just soft. My intent's different, but I'm still transferring energy. I've still got that whole connectivity going through my body of how my body's working as an integrated whole, like an animal would work. All right, guys, I might leave it there. I think I've ranted sufficiently. I think I may have ticked all the little stars on my little list that I created. Uh, I know this went for a really long time, but if you're interested in my channel, I'm sure you will have enjoyed uh, listening. Um, please leave any comments that you have, um, any questions, everything like that. If you'd like to know more specifically about a topic I've touched on, let me know. Um, I think that's me. I think I'm done. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today, guys. Have a lovely uh, Friday, and um, I'm sure I'll rant again very soon. Thanks.